Um, Genesis chapter 22. We're going to um, begin reading at verse number one. Uh, and I'm going to read to you from, you know how I do, the Kendall Wyatt Standard Revised Version of the Bible. It'll be a little different from your Bible, but it'll be close. It should read like this. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, your Shaheed, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I'm going to show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey, took with him his two servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, <laughs> Abraham looked up. This just catches me every time. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Watch this. We will worship and then we will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. Third day, wood. Third day and wood. It's interesting. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he, and, and, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went together. Isaac spoke up and said, uh, Dad. <laughs> yes, son. <laughs> There is fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb to be sacrificed? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to kill him. The angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. Uh, don't lay a hand on him, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now that you fear God, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, your Shahid. Verse number 13. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. <clears throat> when he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son, so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it is provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by me, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son your only son your shahid i will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me lord thank you for this time we're going to share in your word god i pray that you'll do for me now what i cannot do for myself God, give me the ability to declare your word. God, I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner, but I am a sinner saved by grace. So God, I pray that you'll forgive me of anything in me that will keep me from delivering this word the way you gave it to me. God, I want to deliver this meal with clean hands. God, hide me behind the cross. Your people can only see you stretched out dying for our sins. God, I pray that you will guard these words from my mouth to their ears so that Satan won't come and steal this seed. I speak the name Jesus in here. Because your word says that at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. I speak the name Jesus in here. And everything in here that's not like Jesus has to bow in the presence of the name of, I speak the name Jesus in here. God, rule in this house, super rule even in this house. Get the glory out of us today. God, now let it be less of me, but more of thee. God, let it be less of me, but more of thee. God, less of Kendall, but more of you. 
No, God, let it be none of me, but all of thee is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As you take your seat, will you help me preach this? Uh, will you look at somebody and say, this is what happens when men lead worship. The last couple of times I preached, I've been head hunting, so just put your seatbelt on. It's okay. I came for the whole church last time with Eutychus. I'm coming for the men today with Abraham. So just hang in there. It's going to be all right. And don't go telling on me, all right? Don't go tell on me. Um, my son, Cole, uh, my little buddy, I call him Junior. Um, <clears throat> as he's getting older, um, I think he likes me. Um, no, and this is a real thing because he used to, I don't think he, he used to didn't like me. I remember one time I was changing his diaper and I was like, Cole, do you love daddy? Because I said, like, do you love daddy? He would always tell me no. I was like, dang, that's tough. So I was changing his diaper. I said, hey, buddy, do you love daddy? And one time he said, yes, you do? He said, no. I said, that's tough. <laughs> but as he gets older, <laughs> as he gets older and he realizes that he can get toys out of daddy when he gets me isolated, uh, he gets me away from the uh, the money keeper at our at our home. Uh, he can get stuff out of me, right? And so he's a lot nice to me now. And he comes with me a lot to church. So like sometimes he'll come to me rehearsal. Sometimes he'll come with me to Bible study or when I come during the week. Because I have a lot of responsibilities here at the church. Um, in addition to doing, you know, the worship and art stuff. Um, I have this line in my uh, job description that Pastor Johnson put in there uh, so eloquently and so with so much wisdom. And the line says, and other duties as assigned. <laughs> and that other duties as assigned is the one that ends up taking up most of my week. But one of the things I'm responsible for, primarily for our worship, is to make sure that the PA system is on and make sure that the microphones are sanitized. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. We... Um, Cadell and I, we, we monitor the live stream to make sure on our back channel that the live stream is going correctly for those that haven't come to church. Y'all come back to church now. Come on back to church. But those that watch us online still, so we monitor that. But one Wednesday, I was here with Cole doing one of the things that I must do for service, and I had turned on the PA system. I came in here sometimes for Wednesday Bible study. If Dean hasn't set up pastor's lectern, I'll pull it out for him and get it all set up so that when pastor's ready to teach, he can just teach, right? So on Wednesday, we were, on, a, on a Wednesday, we were hanging out, and I was coming out of my office, and Cole said this. He said, Daddy, you can't sing your songs yet. I said, what? <laughs> Just out of nowhere. Cole's a little random, right? Daddy, you can't sing your songs. I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, Daddy, you, you're not going to be able to sing your songs at, in the church because you forgot something. And that's what Isaac was telling Abraham. He said, wait a minute. We, it looks like we're about to go worship, but something's missing. And I want to catch men in here today because the reason why Isaac could recognize when something was missing is because his father took him into the presence of the Lord so much that when something was off, his son could tell. That's the first bomb drop. That when you bring your son, what we're going to learn in Genesis chapter 22, that when you bring your sons specifically to worship, they recognize when they, because they're in the presence of God so much, they recognize when something's off, when something doesn't look right. And so in this text, Abraham has been told by God to take his son to a place in Moriah, on Mount Moriah, and offer him as a sacrifice. And I want you to understand something about this text. Look at verse number one right now. We're going to go right into the text. Look at verse number one. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, look what Abraham says when he heard the voice of God calling him to worship. He said, here I am. Men, when the Lord calls you to do something in the kingdom and for the kingdom, stop talking to me about how often you have to go to work. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord. I got the men. Last time I had the men a little bit on my side. I hope it makes some enemies. Abraham didn't have reasons why he couldn't do what God asked him to do. Abraham said, Lord, here I am. And that's what God wants from you. God wants you to respond to his call. When he called in the day you hear my voice, 
hear my voice, don't harden your heart. When God starts calling you, don't harden your heart. Why? Because we're going to find out later in this text that there are young men needing to see you answer the call of God. So that's the first one. I know it's quiet in here. Boy, it's going to be quiet today. He's, this is what the Lord told him to do in verse number two. He said, take your son, take your promise, take your dream. Oh, Lord. Take your promise, take your son, take your dream, take your yashid, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice your dream there. Sometimes when God calls you, he calls you to sacrifice the thing that he told you he would give you in the first place. Now, this is, confuses me because, God, you told me that you would give me this. You told me I would be a business owner. God, you told me that I would be a therapist. You told me that I would be an attorney. You told me that I would get into middle management or upper management at the factory I work at. You said that to me. Now you're asking me to sacrifice that for the kingdom? Yes, I'm asking you to sacrifice that for the kingdom. And look what God says to him. Take that, take that son, take that dream, the thing I promised you, and I want you to go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice it there. I want you to burn it up for my glory. That is tough. And y'all must be way more spiritual than me because when I was reading this, I was like, wait a minute, Lord. Now, ho, 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 ho. You told me that I was going to be able to do this. Now you want me to be willing to burn it to the ground for your will? Keep reading. Verse 3, look what Abraham does. He hears the voice of God. He doesn't run from the voice of God. He says, God, here I am. God tells him, I want you to sacrifice the thing I promised you. And then look what he does. Early the next morning, <laughs> Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, and took with him two of his young servants and his son Isaac. When Abraham heard the voice of God, he said, God, here I am. He didn't question God. When God said, I need you to make a sacrifice, Abraham, Abraham did not question God requiring him to sacrifice something. Stop questioning God. When you're sitting there in service and you know that the Lord just told you on addition to your tithes and offering, give an additional $250, and you're like, Lord Jesus, $250? What do they need it for? The lights are paid. Stop negotiating with God when he asks you to sacrifice. Just say, God, here I am. What would you like for me to do? And look what Abraham does in, in verse number three, that he takes two of his male servants and his son Isaac. I want to challenge the men in this room that you be like Abraham and that you take your children to worship, but you take somebody else's too. It's going to be tight. It's going to be all right, though. You're going to make it. The 8 o'clock service was still alive at the end. Take yours plus one. Abraham did two. I'm challenging you just to do one. Abraham has a history of taking young men under his wing because he took his nephew Lot under his wing. As a matter of fact, when it was time to go their separate ways, Abraham let Lot choose how much do you want 60% of my wealth or do you want 40%? Lot said, I'm going to take 60, dog. He said, we're going to take, take the 60. We're good. Abraham has a history of not only taking care of his, but taking on someone else's. Do you know that in the, I was reading an article in the late 70s, 80s and, and, and earnest in the 90s that black men started leaving the church. There are many reasons why we left the church and we don't have time to deal with those. But the fact is, we left the church. And would you believe that when black men started leaving the church, that crime went up? When black men started leaving, that you can dovetail them together, that there's parallel lines, they're on parallel tracks, that when you left church, black man, your neighborhood started falling apart. There's a reason for that. And Abraham understood this, that not only do I need to take my household to worship, I need to grab another young man and take him with me. That young man that, that plays video games at your house while they're in there playing Fortnite and he come over the house and they up in that room, be like, well, let me knock on the door and make sure they're alive in there because they've been playing video games for five hours. Knock on that door, tell your son, stop letting your children sit at home. <laughs> I, 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 listen, as a former youth pastor, I'm telling you, you don't give them an option to wash their behind. 
You don't give them an option to hang their clothes up. You don't give them an option to wash your dishes correctly. You don't give them an option of whether or not they're going to school and whether or not they're going to do their homework. Why would you let them choose whether or not they're going to serve God while they're eating your food? Yeah. Abraham said, I'm going to take my son plus one. And when you do that, here's the first thing I want to drop on you in this text that we learned, that when men lead worship, young men get to see the power of God demonstrated. Because these young men, look what Abraham says to them. This is what he says to them. Uh, next, early next morning, he got up and loaded his donkey, took him two servants. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God told him about. Verse 4, on the third day, Abraham looked up, saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, watch this, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and worship, and we will come back. If my theory is correct that Abraham has taken his son consistently to worship, those other young men know what worship looked like too. They knew in the back of their mind, is he about to go in here and, and, and slit Isaac's throat and burn him up? Because we've seen him do that to lambs. But because of their proximity to Abraham, because he took them to worship, when God started moving and God intervened, young men who did not have their own personal experience with God was able to see the power of God through the way Abraham conducted himself. They had to stay over here. They didn't get an up-close and personal encounter with God. They sit at home on Sunday. They don't get an up-close and personal encounter with God. But Abraham, because of how he lived his life, this is why men sometimes, even if you can't get a young man or a young lady to come in here with you, the way you live your life is a testimony about whether or not you're really talking about what you're talking about. Because you say you trust God and you serve God. But if you're acting right, then I believe that you serve God and trust God. Your lifestyle of worship will demonstrate the power of God to young men and young women who might not even believe in God. The Bible does not say where these servants' fathers were. The Bible does not say if these servants were believers like Abraham. What it does say is that Abraham brought his son and them to worship so that they can experience the power of God. The second thing we learned in this text, let's keep reading. On the third day, he woke up. He said, y'all stay here with the donkey. We're going to go worship. We're coming back. Verse number six, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and himself and carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. And look what Isaac says. <laughs> Isaac's no dummy. Isaac says, the Bible says he spoke up. <laughs> and he had been going along with this for a while now, but then he spoke up. And look what he says. He says, he says to his father Abraham, he said, Daddy? <laughs> he was like, yes, son. Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And I gave you a little preview to this when I started my sermon because when you bring your sons into the presence of God, man, when you bring them into the presence of God, when they're around the things of God enough, they recognize when something's off. Your son don't know the difference between a good friend and a bad friend, maybe because he doesn't make good decisions, but it also could be a, a contributing factor that he's not around the things of God and other men of God consistently so that he recognizes when something just ain't right about this group of friends. When men lead worship, sons tend to trust the leading of their father. Isaac knows what's about to happen. <laughs> there's about to be a sacrifice and there's no lamb. I want you to understand this, that Isaac trusted Abraham because Abraham trusted God. And because Abraham trusted God and, and, and Isaac has seen, apparently had seen God work so many times on behalf of his father because his dad took him to worship with him when it was time for Isaac to, to listen to his father in a life or death situation, he was willing to lay down without putting up a fight. Let me help you understand something. When Abraham, when God promises this son to Abraham, by the time Abraham had Isaac, he was old. The man is old. <laughs> and in addition to that, 
By this time, there are a lot of theologians that suggest that Isaac was somewhere between 17 and 20. Now, you're talking about an 18, 19, 20-year-old and a man that's 103, 104 years old. I don't know, Daddy. I love my dad. He's, if he ever sees this video, I love you, Daddy. But let me tell you something. If you say, come on, son, we're going to go fishing with a knife and some fire, I'm like, I don't know, Daddy. Let's, I'll just wait over here for you till you come back. But Isaac trusted Abraham because Abraham was so consistent with his lifestyle. Abraham was so consistent with worship that it rubbed off on the second generation of him that his son trusted God too. When you, come on y'all, when you live a lifestyle of worship and bring them kids to church and they see you be vulnerable in worship, they see you cry out to God, they see, they hear you praying on the side of your bed. I remember as a kid seeing my father on bended knee on the side of the bed praying. I would wake up in the middle of the night with grease all over my forehead as my father's standing like this praying, what they used to call a group apostolic, praying in the Holy Ghost is what they would call it. But he was praying over his son. And look where his son is right now. My father is somewhere right now preaching. <laughs> and his son is here preaching to you. Why? Because I saw my father live out a certain type of lifestyle. So when it was time for a life or death decision to be made, Isaac trusted his father because his father was trustworthy. And his father demonstrated to him through the way he lived his life that God is trustworthy. Abraham had to trust God. Isaac had to trust his daddy and God. If you raise your children the right way and bring them to worship and expose them to the things of God, when it comes to a life or death situation, they will choose the things of God over the things that might bring death to them. When men lead worship, young men get an opportunity to see the power of God demonstrated. When men lead worship, sons trust the wisdom of their fathers. Because the level of trust I have to have in my father in a life or death situation tells me everything I need to know about how consistent Abraham was with his worship. The Bible says, in verse number 8, God answered, God himself, uh, Abraham answered to his son, God himself will provide a burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together. Look at verse number nine. When they had reached the place God had told Abraham about, he built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son. I told you he's 17. He could just shoved him over and broke his hip. But he bound his son and laid him on the altar. Isaac didn't fight one time. Maybe the reason why your kids fight you is because they don't necessarily trust your spiritual acumen. I ain't trying to hurt you. I just want you to hear me. Maybe they don't trust your spiritual acumen. They don't trust that you are hearing from God because they never see you talk to God. That way when you say, son, I know she look good, doc. Listen, I get it. Don't do it. Maybe he can't hear that because he doesn't trust your spiritual acumen. Because he's never seen you demonstrate your spirituality in front of him. Isaac was willing, watch this, because I'm coming back to this. Isaac was willing to lay down his life to please the father. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know how I know I'm doing an okay job with Cole? Because I now find him doing things that he thinks pleases me. So we're in the house, and he'll play with this little, you know, this little basketball goal in the house, and he, you know, he, he'll go, dunk. Daddy, come watch me dunk, and it's the same height as him, but that's okay. So when he, when he goes and dunk, that's okay, just don't judge him. So when he goes and dunk, I'm like, man, oh, my God, man, you look like LeBron James, the best player to ever live. You look like LeBron James. Don't start with me. And he rejoices in that because he wants to please the father. Why? Because I feel like I'm demonstrating to him what it looks like to serve God and love your family and do right by your community. And my son wants to please me. Isaac was willing to lay there if it would please the father. I'm willing to lay down my life if it means it will please the father. And if, as, you keep, as you keep going through this, the Bible says at verse number 10 that when, they, when he reached out his hand to take the knife and cut his throat, 
Look what happens. The Bible says the angel of the Lord cried out from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And guess what Abraham did? Here I am. Because when you hear God calling you, don't run from God because God might be trying to call out to you to save you from making a mistake. He says, here I am. This is what the angel of the Lord says. Watch this. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld him from me, your son, your shaheed. Watch this. Look who's, look, and those of you that have been in Bible study, you know what I'm about to say right here. This is a Christop. This is a Christophany. If you've been, there it is. If you've been in Bible study, that's why I need to come to Bible study because you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. You need to come to Bible study because this is a Christophany. Let me help you. A Christophany is Jesus himself showing up in the Old Testament. Look at this. This is how I know it's Jesus. Look at it. Let me prove it. Verse 10, verse 10, he reached out his hand to take the knife to slay his son. But then the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. This is Jesus himself. And I'm going to come back to this. But this is Jesus himself asking Abraham to say, his son keep walking now that I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son from me your dream that aspiration yes the thing I promised you because I know you're not willing to hold on to it you're willing to sacrifice that dream for me look how God responds to it and here's the third thing when men lead worship it forces the hand of God watch this watch this he said, don't lay a hand on him. I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your only son from me, your Shahid. Then verse 13, Abraham looked up and in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Where does the Lord provide? Anybody here need provision from God? This is where the Lord provides. The Lord provides at the place where you're willing to sacrifice a dream. Ah, if you're willing to sacrifice your dream for the glory of God, the Lord will provide. And the Bible says that, that he called that place Jehovah Jireh, the place that the Lord provides. And to this day on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Look at verse number 15. Look how the angel of the Lord responds again. That Christophany, he, he called out to Abraham again from heaven the second time and said, watch this. I love it. I swear by me. That is tough in this, it is tough in this text. You swear to God and God tells us, don't swear, don't swear by me. Don't, don't do that because you don't have the authority to swear by me. But apparently Jesus, God, he looked around and could find nobody worthy of swearing by. That is so tough. He's in heaven. He looked around. He looked at the seraphim, the, the seraphim, the cherubim. He looked at the angels that fly around the throne saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is, was, and in the, is to come. He looked at Gabriel, the archangel. He looked at Michael, the archangel. And he looked around and found nobody else that he could swear by. And then God says, I swear by me. Look what he says. I swear to myself. <laughs> I swear to me, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, this thing and have not withheld your dream, your shaheed, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed me. When men lead worship, not only do other young men see the power of God demonstrated when you live a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle that pleases God, other young men will see the power of God demonstrated in your life. Not only that, but your sons tend to trust you a little more. But not only that, but when you lead worship men, when you set the tone of worship and how we follow and serve the Lord in this house, the Bible says that you force the hand of God to provide for you. Not only does God provide for you, but then God speaks a blessing upon your children's children. 
Let me help you out. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, Paul tells Timothy, he said, all that ministry that's in you didn't start with you. All that ministry that's within you started in your mama, but it started in your grandmama. Don't you know that the great, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Don't you know that the greatest heritage you can leave for your children is a heritage of them serving the living God? Let me tell you something. Watch this. My great-grandfather was a pastor. My grandfather is sleeping with the Lord. He was a pastor. My father is a pastor. I am a pastor. And my hope is that my son or daughter will keep this in the bloodline. Why? It's a good inheritance. Teach your son that we go to church in this family. We serve God in this family. We serve our community in this family. We serve our wives in this family. We serve our children in this family. That's what we, and pass that inheritance down. And God said, and God says to him, he says, because you have done this, I swear by myself that I'm going to bless the seed of Isaac. Now, why should you rejoice over that? And I'm almost done. Why should you rejoice over that? Let me tell you why. Because I've been saying this word to you, this word shahid, shahid. And I'll, I'll, excuse me, Yashid, Yashid is what it is, Yashid. And the reason why I want you to understand this word is because that word only shows up twice in the whole Bible. It's a Hebrew word that only shows up twice in the whole Bible. It shows up right here in Genesis chapter 22, but then it also shows up in John 3, 16. Y'all don't know when it's out. <laughs> Woo! So watch this. Let me put it all together for you because we're about to go home. Let me put it together. We're going to get out early. Let me put it together for you. If this is true, and the angel of the Lord is Jesus himself on Mount Moriah, then Jesus tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. Jesus tells the father to sacrifice the son. And because the father was willing to give the son up, the son was willing to lay down his life to please the father. And the Bible declares over in John, chap John chapter 3 verse 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only shahid <laughs> that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And if that's true that this was Jesus on Mount Moriah, then essentially what happened is that God was foreshadowing him sacrificing his son. Oh, I want to run around this room. If that's true, then watch this. The son in the Old Testament saves his, his eventual father. You want to know why? Because if, if Abraham sacrifices Isaac, then Jesus can't come down through 42 generations. In that moment, listen to me. In that moment, Jesus could have saved himself from the cross. In that moment, Jesus could have saved himself from the cross. Because if Isaac dies on Mount Moriah, Jesus doesn't have to die on the cross. But because Jesus wanted to please the Father, the Bible says that before the foundation of the earth was laid, that there was a lamb slain. The Bible said that it pleased the Father to see his son bruised on the cross. Why? Because Jesus being bruised on the cross meant that you could get eternal life. Is there anybody in here that's glad that the father was willing to sacrifice the son and that the son was willing to lay down his life? But here it is. The reason why Jesus was willing to lay down his life is because he trusted the father. Jesus was willing to lay down his life. Why? Because he knew that the father could raise him back up. Is there anybody in here? So glad that the Father has the ability to raise you up that you can trust the Father. The Father is trustworthy. Is there anybody in here that knows that the Father is trustworthy? Lift your hands and open your mouth and say you are trustworthy. Lift your hands and open your mouth and say you are trustworthy. If you want me to sacrifice my dream, if you want me to sacrifice this business, if you want me to sacrifice this relationship, I'll lay it down so I can please the Father. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm willing to please the Father. I'm willing to please the Father. I'm willing to please the Father. 
Why? Because the Father is trustworthy. If the Father tells you to lay down your life, the Father is trustworthy. If he tells you to sacrifice your money, the Father is trustworthy. Watch this. Hold on a second. Don't you know that the Bible says that Jesus was in the beginning with the Father? Jesus is in the beginning with the Father. And Jesus has seen the consistency of the Father for eons. He saw the consistency of his father. So when it came to a life or death decision, Jesus said, I'll lay it down. Because I trust you, father. Abraham had to trust God. Isaac had to trust his father and God. And if it's done right, men, if you lead worship in your home, if you lead worship in this building, if you lead worship in how you live your life, not only will the son trust you, but just like me, the son will trust God and you. When men lead worship, when we lead in worship, other young men who are watching you see the power of God demonstrated in their life. They see the power of God because not all of these young men could get to the worship like Isaac could but Abraham brought them anyway so they could see the power of God demonstrated do you realize man how powerful it is when you lift your hands in worship your babies are watching you your little babies Yo, teenage babies, men don't get credit for how we love our kids. I'm a father's rights advocate. We don't get credit for how much we love our... I know you love those kids too, but I love them too. And I'm telling you, I know you love your kids and your grandchildren. I know you love them and they're watching you. Show them what it looks like to serve God. Because when it's time for you to have, when it's time for them to have to trust you, when their life depends on it, you want them to remember that you have a gateway to God yourself because you're connected to him in worship, because you're connected to him when you read your Bible. Let them kids see you cry out in church. Let them grab them kids every now and then when your son's born. I don't care if he's 25, grab him. Grab him, put his head on your shoulder and say, Lord, bless my son. Increase his wisdom. Help him be a better husband. Help me be a better father and grandfather. Because there will come a time when it's a life or death decision that has to be made and you need Isaac to trust you. When you lead worship in a lifestyle of worship, young men see the power of God your children will trust you and you will force God's hand to provide stand to your feet if you're in this room and you don't know the Lord the pardon of your sins I want to introduce you to the Yashid the only begotten of the father the only son God ever had who was willing to lay down his life to please the will of his father I want to introduce you to him his name is Jesus here at Mount Pleasant we believe you have to do three things to be saved we believe that you have to admit believe and confess we call it the ABC's of salvation you have to admit that you are a sinner a sinner meaning that you've made mistakes and that you're not perfect and that you need God. Then you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross and that the Father raised him from the dead. <laughs> and then you have to confess that out of your mouth. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died and, we, and that he rose. And then you got to say that. I believe 
I'm a sinner, but I do believe. And when you do that, we believe according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you believe and confess, that you shall be saved. If you're in this room and you are a Christian, but you don't have a church home, we would love to be your brothers and sisters in Christ. We would love to have you here. There's a lot of really great things going on in Mount Pleasant. I would love to meet you and talk to you. And as Pastor Johnson would say, our senior pastor, if it's right to be in church, then that means it's wrong not to be in church. So those are two people I want to talk to today. If you want to accept Christ, or if you need a church home, you need a church that you can connect with so you can grow and get better and have some support and some relationships and friendships, we would love to have you here at our koinonia, our fellowship. So that's what I want you to do. I'm going to sing a little bit of this song, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a decision either for Christ or to come and unite with our church, all right? Come on, right here. Whoa, cause now is the time. Today is the day. And don't you hesitate. And don't let it be said too late. He's standing with open arms, ready to receive. Just move right now. Tomorrow is not. Cause now is the time